It was obviously a mistake what he did. Don't pad. Tell me what you mean by resentment. You don't resent the referee, well, do his, you? It, you don't rec do, no, do you he, resent he Diego Simeone? Like, uh, where's your resentment? Well, that he made a mistake. I was a boy or Everton fan, but I'm going to be hated now. But I've got no option. Like, literally within a day, Nicky Butt phoned me and said, uh, just so you know, the gaffer's going to call you. Right. I'm like, who's the gaffer? He goes, Sir Alex, watching match of the day on that night. And I start hearing, we want our money back yeah, or what a waste of, waste of money or something like that. And to me, you know, it was just like, you what? This is up front with me, Simon Jordan. I believe there are a lot of vacuous, uninformed, unchallenged opinions out there. I want to get to the bottom line and cut through the nonsense. So with this podcast with William Hill, I'm going to get people with strong views who think they can stand them up to proper scrutiny. There's a good chance I might learn something along the way. And more importantly, so might you. Joining me in today's episode, a top goal scorer for some of the world's most iconic football clubs. He memorably burst onto the World Cup stage in 1998 as a teenager against the Argentinians. He's picked up domestic honours amongst the Premier League's biggest rivalry, a treble with Liverpool and a Premier League title at Manchester United, a Galactico for a period of time, while being just one of the four Englishmen to win the Ballon d'Or. Michael Owen, welcome to Upfront. When I get these shows and talk to you guys and superstars and people that have achieved great things in the sport, one of the things that I try to get into is what it is that created them. So it, it gets framed in an overriding question of what is your why? So what makes Michael Owen have had the career that he had? What set you up from you, where you started as a kid? What was your personality? What made you become as successful as you were at times in your career? Well, I think the overriding view and feeling that I have about why I made it to the top, let's mm -hmm. say, was my mentality. I think being part of a big family, having two older brothers certainly helped. I think a lot of people will either give in when their brothers give them a beating at football or in a fight or whatever it might be. And some people just go to bed thinking, I'll have you tomorrow. Um, my dad was a professional footballer, played in the lower leagues yeah, for, that, for yeah. most of his yeah. uh, life. And was he a striker? He was a striker, yeah. yeah. And, you know, my dad was my hero, genuinely. Yeah. My Everyone says it, but he genuinely was. You know, when I used to go onto a pitch and see him stood behind the goal, that was my you know, my reference point. Yeah. Whenever I did something badly, I would sneakily take a little sly look out the corner of my eye, petrified that he was going to be shaking his head. Never shouted at me once. Right. Never, ever shouted. Never physical. Never, ever shouted at me. But the pain of upsetting him was a real guiding light for me. And if I did something good in my life, if I scored a goal, if I dribbled past somebody, if I whatever I did... I would turn full, you know, fully round to just see the little yeah. nod of appreciation. So I think I had something, he had something over me. Um, and I think it's really important to have one or two people in your life that you're desperate to impress. We all want to impress certain people. Sometimes if, if I wasn't in my dad's good books for whatever reason, and he will say, don't be silly, that was never the mm. case. But I felt it. Um, the worst thing he could ever do to me is not talk to me until the next game when I sort of redeem myself, let's say. Um, and he wasn't, he didn't mean to to do a lot of the, the things. I was just very, you know, aware of it, let's say. What was this mentality? I mean, you, you you touched upon it briefly, said I developed a mentality and then you went, you, you segued straight into your relationship with your father. But what was the mentality that you had? Oh, that I was not going to be a footballer. I was going to be the best footballer in the world. Right. That was my, when I used to, you know, when I used to, I used to follow my dad everywhere. I used to play golf on a Sunday and and, and I would just love just sitting in the clubhouse at the end because he'd play snooker mm -hmm. then. And I'd, and I'd see people coming up to him and saying, is that is that's your lad in the corner with his bag of crisps and can of Coke? Mm -hmm. And my dad is so quiet, so, you know, not big headed at Unassuming, all. Unassuming, yeah. And I used to sort of see him, hear him saying, oh yeah, you know, he will, he will be... He'll be a full, inter full England international. Absolutely no question about Only it. Only ever football. Only ever. Yeah, I mean, he got a bit panicky in the summers when there was no football on and I used to go play golf with my right. mates for six weeks of the summer holidays, made sure I still 
like football more than uh, more than golf. I used to box myself. I boxed right. for about three or four years as a kid. He did that only to toughen me up. Right. Um, but that seed that he planted in my head constantly, no matter what we did, where we went, you know, everything was a challenge. I'd eat an apple in the, you know, watching the the, the TV at night, right. and the bin would be by the TV, you know, six meters away or whatever it was. And well, I would just do it. I had the bravery to to miss and for there to be a stain on the wallpaper and my mum right. to absolutely scream at me and send me upstairs. I wasn't cocky at all, but the next day I'd do the same and I'd be bump and it'd go right in the middle and my dad would give me a nod of approval and my mum would be seething but couldn't say anything because it went in. Um, and that confidence, that sort yeah. of daring, yeah. that nod of approval, that I, I don't want to get bollocked by my, da by my mum here, but oh God, I'm desperate for a nod of it, like a little wink to say, from my dad to say, bloody hell, you cocky little, you know. Uh, and that's what I always yearned as a kid. I mean, very driven seems to be a terminology that gets associated with you at times in terms of your belief system and your confidence. And when I'm talking to you now, I can see that you're very self-assured, as we all should be at certain stages in our life. But your, your dad talked about you, and he talks about you as a, as a he, his coordination was exceptional, but it was his mentality that set him apart he was a forceful character, relentless in his pursuit of getting his own way. I've never met anybody with a mind as strong as his. Now, that touches upon the belief system and the mentality. But is there, a, is there, was there ever any contemplation in your mind that there wasn't going to be the outcomes? Did you ever get priced into your thinking, there's a possibility I won't be a professional footballer, and not only a professional footballer, but the stated aim of a world-beating professional footballer? Never with football. But I, Never. I no, not absolutely. But I stand on a fairway and think exactly what you just said. Which you is, know, well, the water's there. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure you get it over. You yeah. don't even look at the yeah. pin type of. So I have got that in me. Right. I'm probably realistic, but not when it comes to football. Um, that was my mentality at the time. It's, uh, it's, it's. I'm going to make it. It leads me on to a question. There's two questions. I, I'm going to do them in a different order than I was originally going to do them. But you touched upon the mental side of things. Because one of the conversations that's come out, Stuart Broad specifically, as a cricketer, talked about, you have to have a baseline of ability, of course you do, right? But he talked about the ability to be at the very top of your game is 90% mental and 10% ability. What do you think to that? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't necessarily agree with the percentages but i do think it's far more mental than than people give it credit yeah. for because let's get it right every single player that you watch running around on on a on a saturday in the premier league you would have no idea which really if you went and did a physical test who were the best and who are the, they're, they're pretty mm. they're all fit they're all strong they're all so that's know, my capable point. so after that once you've been given the tools from a physical point of view it's only mental right it's only you, mental then you there's a lot of analogies i mean you've gone into liverpool in football academies and development prospects was it an academy when you went in there was it considered an academy or was it just a youth uh, development policy because i don't I'd think academy development come, well development. no funny enough me and stephen gerrard within the same right. same year and we were both, you know, yeah, equally, potatoes, you know, we're yeah. both going to make it, I guess. And I was ready probably earlier than him. We were in the same year, as I say, but I was ready and, and about to go into the first team. And I think Liverpool at the time, the academy was actually being built and they right. wanted somebody to come out of it. Right. So I was sort of fast-tracked that mm -hmm. way. Steven Gerrard had to go the other way. He literally did a week or two in the academy and then came yeah. down to Melwood with the rest of us. But of course, for political, you know, political things and everything else like that, we can now say Stephen Gerrard is a as a, a graduate of the Liverpool Academy. Mm. Really, he's he he wasn't and he isn't. Um, but he did spend a couple of weeks there. Well, well, the reason why I ask is because I have this resistance to the idea. You see these documentaries like Panorama and stuff like that when they get into the youth development pos uh, part of football clubs and they categorise them as this this dream factory that has the brutal other side of it, and it's called a sausage factory. But when you hear this assessment of academies as sausage factories, you were in part a product of it. You've just said that there was this idea that they wanted to push you through so that you could be a poster boy for the success of academies and ultimately Liverpool's youth development system. But do you, do you recognise that sort of terminology? Do you think that's a fair analysis, that it's a bit brutal, it's a bit blunt, the football clubs don't give a monkeys, as long as you, if you make it, that's fine, but if you don't, you're out? No, I would, I would, I would sit 
on your side of the fence yeah. here. I think that you're given an um, an amazing opportunity. Um, but in life, you know, forget football. In life, you're constantly getting knocked back. You're constantly yep. having disappointments. Um, let's get it right. I mean, people say to me, oh, you know, we've got, got to do something. And yes, I'm, I'm all for, I'm all for, you know, clubs creating a, a pathway. If, if you're not quite good enough, finding you a different club, finding you a different yep. career, all these things. Of course, I'm, uh, I'm for that. But this notion that, People think like a, a young 17 year old player that's been in an academy since he's six, let's say, all of a sudden have their dreams dashed in front of them in in one foul swoop, in one meeting with the academy director. It's a load of nonsense. Mm. I mean, these kids, if they're getting let go, they know it's coming. Yeah. And they've prepared themselves probably for a couple of years. If I'm a right back and the left winger keeps running past me in training every single day, do you know what? I'm actually going to be relieved eventually when they say, you know, you don't have to do this anymore. You come to terms with it. You, It's in any walk of life. You feel like you're struggling. Do you know what? This isn't quite for me. I'm just not at this level, et cetera, et cetera. And do you know what? If you're just below it, then they're not just going to throw you on the scrap heap. Yeah. You might go down a level, but you've still got a, a career. But for those for those people that that think that football clubs just all of a sudden throw them out, it's it's you know, yes, some people are let go yeah. and say, you know what, I don't think this career is for you. You might have to find another career, but that's not a surprise to these lads. No. It's not a surprise at all. They've been running around a pitch for for years and years and years, feeling this, feeling it. But it's also the reality of life, Michael, isn't it? I mean, I'm in the camp, without wanting to be too generalistic, that we need a bit more resilience. And we don't always get what we want. And whilst it may be disappointing, what you do is you take a knockback and you build from it rather than... Because I just it kind of irritates me when I see these documentaries no. on television going, it's a terrible industry, they don't care, it's no. all about... But it's only labelled at football because, you know, with all due respect, everybody wants to be a footballer. Exactly. And, and you know, take any other job. You know, if you're told at some point you're not going to be a, a banker, but you can be, you know, something half similar... Then it's not going to absolutely knock the stuffing out of you. But if you're not going to be a football, everyone dreams of being a footballer. So really, it's the dream that everybody has that 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 people sort of, you know, have a stick to bash it with. But the reality of it is just like any other walk of life. You a Liverpool fan? Yeah. You were a Liverpool fan. Not well, an I was Everton, an Everton, not an Everton fan. fan yeah. I was an Everton fan until I was ten or eleven. Um, of course, when you know Everton were the best team that my dad, played, your dad for. played for. Yeah. So yeah. when you go into school and someone says, "Who do you support?" It's like, "Oh, my dad, and my Everton," because my dad played for them. So that was the that was the theory. But as soon as I went to Liverpool and I was there for a year or two, then uh, quickly changed. When you go in there and you you land in this dressing room that has Paul Ince. Jason McAteer, Steve McManaman, Patrick Berger, Robbie Fowler, one of my players, my players, Neil Roddick. What was it like for you coming in that dressing room with all these characters and that sort of imagery that was reverberating around? Well, at the time, you're so overawed and so, you know, looking up to these people. I think it was a brilliant dressing room uh, to walk into. Loads of fun, uh, loads of laughs. They took me under their wings in, in many ways and, and looked after me. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't criticise it in any way, shape, or form. Did it phase you to walk into that environment and to perhaps the expectation that you would have of yourself, and maybe because you're coming through the academy and people would have heard about this young kid that's coming through that's going to be potentially something? Did any of that unnerve you? Was it just a natural progression for you? Totally natural. Yeah, getting on my nerves. Yeah. You are. No, I no, and and do you know what? But but yeah. You know, you can ask me about doing other things and whatever, and I'd say, yeah, you know what, that was quite nerve-wracking when I first yeah. did this or did that. Football never, ever, never... I I didn't have any knockbacks, really, um, coming through the ranks. Everything I did, I tended to, to, you know, pass the test, let's say, and go to the next level. You get nervous if you can't do something. You, I'll get nervous if you put me on a first tee now yeah. and you're watching. Yeah. I'd be like, oh, Simon's never played me, never watched me play golf before, and this could go left, it could go right. Could go up. It could when go, you know you can do it, yeah. Put me in front of yeah. eight billion people. Put me in front of them. You know, if I've got a football at my feet, then I just not. No, I'm not worried mm. at all. This this ninety seven ninety eight season, you come in, you score twenty three goals. You now land in the England setup. You go to the England. You go to the World Cup in ninety eight. Um, 
was this a very exciting period for you? It was, but it wasn't. It was a, it was a little bit of a frustrating lead up as well. I mean, bear in mind, I made my debut in the England team in February mm -hmm. of the first season. I'd have a, yeah, you know, ninety eight, yeah, 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 and. But at the time, you think of the strikers. You know, Shearer Sheringham was just in stone. Yeah. I mean, they'd had an unbelievable, yeah. you know, Euro 96, 96 yeah. In, yeah. In, in England. But just think of the players behind that. Robbie Fowler scoring mm. 30 plus a year. Andy Cole scoring yeah. 30 plus a year. You know, Les Ferdinand, Stan Collymore, mm. Chris Sutton, Dion Dublin just won a golden boot. Oh, we had like the most incredible. And then you've got players that played in behind that could play, like Paul Merson, and mm. Paul Scholes and... So Gaza, we had so many good players. So I had no idea that I was going to be in the England team so soon. But once I got into the team in February and I played and all the rest of it, then I believed I was going to go to the World Cup. But I had a frustration that I'm never going to split this pairing up. Shearer Sheringham was just, as I say, cast in stone. So I was going to the World Cup thinking, oh, you know, and I wasn't used to not playing. I'd never not played. And I was just sort of, a little bit, yes, you could say, oh, you're going. But going is not, you know, to Same me at the time, right? it's, yeah. you know, well, of course I'm going to go type of attitude, but I want to play. Would you relate to the observation that people might have equated? See, I don't believe in the expression arrogant. I hate the expression arrogance. I think arrogance is not a complimentary way of being told that you are because it's, I think arrogance is based upon ignorance, quite frankly, whereas confidence is based upon belief. Can you understand why people might have thought that some of the things that you exhibit not now as an older man, but perhaps at the time, would smack of arrogance? I would not think so, no, because I was very, very aware. I watch players now and I just think, wow, I can see your head as just totally, you're just now a footballer. You've got no, you know, you've got no personal skills. You've got no, you know, you just, I mean. What do you mean by that? What I mean by that is that it's very easy in life. Like what I did, what a lot of people do, I'd leave home and I'd go to go to work. And when I leave home, I'm a brother, I'm a son, yeah. I'm a you know, I'm I'm a friend to a lot of people in my area, et cetera, et cetera. When I go through the Mersey Tunnel and I'm playing for Liverpool and fifty thousand people sing your name and everyone wants your photograph and you yeah, yeah. that is bollocks. Really, in the scheme of life, it's it's great, yeah. but it's absolutely something that you take with a pinch of salt. You embrace. You have to live the part, you know, you you because you're going onto that pitch. You need, you know, I want people singing my name. It makes me feel yeah. better about myself. But if you think that then when you turn around at the end of the game and go through the Mersey Tunnel and go home, that you're still that person. Yeah. If you don't think you've like. I always thought I've got two lives now and this life is only going to be a 10 year life or a 15 year life. If you're lucky, the people that really struggle in life after football as well, the people that, that, that jumped into that world mm. and think, and, and you are, oh, forget that one. And you think that's the norm. And then you crave for everything when you, what gives you that? I mean, that's a very mature response. Is it something you've developed with the benefit of hindsight, or was it something you had at the time? Because it's a very mature outlook. No, that's absolutely the time. I would never have been able to do what I did at 17, at 18. I'm going, like, yeah. representing my country. I'm, I know you are, yeah. But also, I was at home. You ask, you know, you ask my mum, you ask my dad, you ask my wife, you, my brothers and sisters. I was a normal person. Yeah. I didn't come home and think, hey, you know, now yeah. I'm watching my... No, my brother's in the room. He's older than me. He gets to watch the yeah, channel. It's yeah. not like, hang on a minute, I just put, made my debut for England. I've just come back from the World Cup. Now I can watch the TV. It's hierarchy. You know, it's like... So I, 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 I always separated and always can separate. And I think it's very dangerous if you can't separate. So, well, your question was, do, do, do you feel, you know, you had an arrogance or did you feel that people would... Well, of course I had an arrogance yeah. when I went onto the pitch. A confidence. But a confident, well, yeah. an arrogance as well. You can't go into a boxing ring as you well. You can't cross, mm. a, you know, and play in a World Cup or a Premier League game without having a bit of arrogance about you, especially if you're not, you know, if you're an attacking player. I'm not a defender. That's my job. I, every time I get it, I just boot it into row Z and everyone claps and, you know, tackle us. Like, <laughs> You don't I'm sure they say there's something to a bit more than well, that. You don't really need an arrogance to do that, do you? Right. I mean, but to be creative and brave and, 
You need an arrogance yeah. to do that. Okay. I would, and, have, I would have said supreme confidence, but if you're happy with the terminology... Arrogance. Well, no, I don't like the yeah. word arrogance. Yeah, I like and I hate it. But when I come back off the, off the pitch, I would like to think people thought, do you know what? He's a nice guy. You were launched... I mean, okay, you weren't a secret when you go to the World Cup. And there's the background noise about Hoddle and whether you're going to play and whatever else that goes on. And of course, we have this game which sets you on to a different trajectory in terms of public consciousness and recognition. But in that game, there's an instant, and you refer to it, so you open this box, so I'm going to have a little delve into it, about David Beckham um, and him getting sent off. Um, and I think you said in your book that you hold, you still hold some resentment towards him or towards the incident. What did you mean by that? I mean, let's get it right. I don't think it was a red card, but that's irrelevant. I mean, what do I mean by that? Mm. It was obviously a mistake what he did. Um, I don't pad. Tell me what you mean by resentment. You have a resentment towards something that happened. You don't resent the referee, well, do you? His, it, you don't rec do, no, do you resent Diego Simeone? Right. Uh, Where's your resentment? Well, that he made a mistake. Right. And, you know, football, to get to the very top level is hard enough. You, A lot of people get one shot at a World Cup. Right. If you're very lucky, you get two or whatever. But um, he made a mistake. Of course he made a mistake. Everyone would... He, he would... would uh, he would admit that. And... You could say that contributed to to us going out of the World Cup, and that's mm. a big thing. So, is that your resentment? Yeah, like you have resentments to every, like to a lot of things. If you use the word resentment, obviously I use that yeah. word. But I mean, two of our lads, I love Paul Hintz. I mean, he's yeah. a big mate of mine. But he missed a pen. I probably yeah. resent him choosing that way instead of that way. Okay. I resent David making a decision to yeah. kick out on a player. Of course, because you know it's going to be picked up, and you write something like that, and because of the Beckham scenario and all that's gone with it, it's going to be picked up. And if you haven't written that you resent Paul Wintz for missing a penalty, then you have to be kind of held accountable mm. in this conversation because it's going to be a trigger subject where you suggest that you resent Beckham for being sent off. And I'm just trying to understand, is that resentment because you think he was irresponsible? Is that resentment because you think it was selfish and silly and childish of him to have got sent off? Is that resentment because it impacted upon the team's performance to go on and win the game, albeit you didn't lose to weird penalties? That's what I'm trying to understand. All of those. All of those things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, his mistake, his whatever, you you know, childish mistake, irresponsible mistake, whatever, however you want to describe it, it was a mistake that he made. So, of course, all of those things you think, cool, if he, if he didn't do that, could have had 11 men... We would have beaten Argentina. Yeah, I'm yeah, absolutely agree, yeah. convinced we were the better team. Yeah. We had to play for an hour or something with with ten men, and you know what would have happened? We had an unbelievable team. So of course I think to myself, cool. That could have been. It could have been. You know, and and always, you know, England have got a, a history of of self imploding. And a Indeed. Lot of, yeah. You know, I remember Wayne Rooney stamping on someone. Mm -hmm. I had actually gone home. I did my knee, so I was already out. But you know, you just think. Cool. A lot of the tournaments we've gone out, it's actually not necessarily for footballing reasons. It's mm. not because we were the worst team. It was because we've done something. We've almost shot ourselves in the mm. foot. So, of so course, yeah I, have, yeah, I I, go to bed regularly thinking, how didn't we win something with England? The teams that we had. What do you make of, I mean, obviously, um, there's been this recent documentary that, that, that Beckham's done with Netflix. And there was this very strong assessment of Glenn Hoddle. I, I like Glenn. I um, and I know there's been observations. I've heard Ian Wright talk about the, the difficulty uh, Glenn had with managing players because the level of ability that Glenn had, sometimes he couldn't get it from the players that played for him. And that was a frustration that sometimes the players felt. Um, but the observation was made, um, I think it was specifically by Victoria Beckham, but also, also, yeah, it's pretty much by, um, by, by Ted and um, by um, Sandra. Sandra. Um, that Hoddle kind of really threw David Beckham to the wolves um, in terms of didn't protect him, didn't um, make it about a team. Was very much this was a, a, a decision that cost us the game. When you when you I don't know if you've seen that, but when you hear that, do you think that's do you think that's fair management from Glenn? 
Well, I can understand uh, the Beckham's family, as you just mentioned, the, the four names. I can understand that at that time, the world went absolutely mad and was was very, very angry towards David at that point. Um, yeah, ridiculously over the top, by the uh, way. Yeah. yeah. And so I can understand that at the time, I mean, you know, when everybody is going at you like that, it must be a hot... You're just petrified to come out your front door. Mm. So I guess that at the time, you're wanting certain people to to probably come up and, and have your back, I guess. I can't remember exactly what was said in the interviews after and whether Glenn did do that. Uh, I certainly know that Glenn, because I've spoken to him about it a few times, doesn't think it was a sending off and thinks it was a, a, a joke of a decision, mm. et cetera, et cetera. So, but I can understand that if I was in a moment of need, everyone pats you on the back when you're doing well, if I was at a moment of need when I made a big mistake and I'm wanting forgiveness and I'm wanting my friends to mm. stick up for me, et cetera, um, that you w would want someone in that situation, i.e. the manager or i.e. the captain or whoever it might be to come out and, and, and support you. I can totally understand that, yeah. And I think, you know, Glenn was an incredible manager. In fact, I've said before that I think if he had stayed as the manager and yeah. been with the manager of that golden generation, the yeah. next generation, I think we would have won a World Cup. Absolutely. Yeah. And it was... Uh, so, listen, I'm sure Glenn looks back and thinks one or two decisions that he made, he would he would change. But, you know, let's have it right. He was top class. And as I say, I think we would have won a World Cup under him. You now, you're now accelerating and I'm going to move you through to 2001 you know, you do this. To, you do this treble. You score this hat trick against Germany, um, which you know elated everybody. You seem to be in the right place at the right time for the right uh, outcomes. But also, you you know, one of the, one of these rare breeds. I'm fortunate enough, enough to have had two of you on this on this series of a Ballon d'Or winner. You know, that's quite a I mean, at Rude Um and and now you're here, and you're a very rare breed. Um, do you think? that achievement is given enough credits full stop and did you think when you got it that you were the best player in the world no no but yes yeah okay <laughs> no but yes so no i no, no i did realistically no, no, because no you're i humble didn't for the purpose of this conversation no, no 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 because i knew no because i knew i because i didn't think i was right um, Brazilian Ronaldo, I looked to him and thought, you know, yeah. he, you know, there were, there were better players than me in the world. Yeah. But it's, it's like, it, but when I get on the pitch, it's like saying to a boxer or anyone, if I'm about to have a fight, with you, you know, you probably beat me up in a fight. Yeah. But actually when we start fighting, I'm in it. I'm yeah. not, yeah. you know, I don't think I will lose. Mm -hmm. And I know what I felt like when I crossed the white line. And that was like I was. But realistically, when I sit here, no. There was there was other players that were better than me at the time. Zidane was around. Um, as I say, Ronaldo. Um, there was a there was a fair few great players at the time. Do you think the standards of of winning a Ballon d'Or have are very different from when you won? No. You don't? No. Even though the achievements of certain no, players you, are, are at a different level. No. He's got 50 goals a season, no. Michael. Come on. No. No? Why? I'd actually go the other way. Why is that? Well, I think footballers were more pure footballers, you know, back in the day. What do you mean by that? Well, now you have to be an athlete. Right. You just have to be able to run. You have to be big. You have to be fast. You have to, you know, you have to be covering X amount of kilometres. If Matt Letizia, one of you know one of the most gifted yeah. players of of our time of our generation, you know, would he get into a team now? He's like, you know, there's loads of great players that were absolute ballers, proper proper mm -hmm. talented. Now, if you can just run a bit further than everyone else and you can basically pass it from A to B, you're getting a decent career in the Premier League. You don't really? even have to be that good anymore. Mm. Back in the day, you had to have real, real skill and attributes to be a top player. You had to be a footballer. Does now it, you have to be an athlete. Does that and mean then a footballer. by that association? Because this was the lead-on question. If you were playing today, you'd smash it. 
because then you know you've got Haaland scoring 38 40 goals Harry Kane scores 30 goals a season players are scoring the, the you know the top players are now scoring more than one in two one in two was always the benchmark wasn't it mm. if you've got a record of one yeah, in two yeah. you're a proper player a proper goal scorer if you were playing today with that in mind would you expect to be punching right at that level and scoring that sort of level of goals? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Is that yeah. because you're confident or because you believe that? No, I totally believe. Right. I'm not even... Not even like, digged out. No, I mean... Yeah, people in my generation, like Ronaldo, Brazilian Ronaldo, is any, do you think Haaland's better than him? Or do you think any, you know, Thierry Henry, do you think Haaland... Do you think these these people, if you put them in Manchester City, so I love Erling Haaland, by the way. I think he's just like playing a different yeah. game. He's just amazing. But do you think if Thierry Henry was playing for, for Manchester City in that position, he wouldn't be scoring? Or, or as I say, Ronaldo, Brazilian Ronaldo, or, or you know, I'm talking about the greats of, of, of that generation. Of course they would. Of course they would. After the Ballon d'Or, you start to get blighted by injuries, don't you? Yeah, it starts to be a challenge for you physically. Um, you tell you, I think you, I think you say yourself that you peak at twenty two. Am I? Fit? Is that right analysis? Yeah, I mean, yeah, slow death. I like to say. <laughs> and there's no criticism of anybody here because the medical information at the time was the medical information yeah. at the time. But do you think if there was better medical intelligence around at the time, that some of the challenges that you had? And, and specifically, if you're losing hamstring, then you're if you're losing your hamstrings, then you're losing power, aren't you? An explosive power, which was which was your game, wasn't it? Yeah. The ability to move quick. Do you think that that would have been a solution to you if you'd have been if there was if there was more thought into handle what you needed and what was required of you? Hundred percent. If the medical, you know, state of play state now, state of play now was yeah. I I would have I would have played double the amount of games. Right, and I probably would have been, you know. Won a lot more, a lot more goals, a lot more accolades, etc. cetera. Uh, I see myself as I did what I did for four, five years, six years, seven years, whatever. And then I was, I regressed. And I would have seen myself as, as being able to continue that. Um, in my mind, I had one injury. I snapped my, I ruptured for the medical terms. I yeah. ruptured my um my hamstring and my right leg, one of, you've got three hamstrings, I ruptured one of them. Um, and when, for those people c that can see me here and not just listen to me, when you rupture your hamstring, it acts like an elastic band in a mm -hmm. way it, and it, it tears and yeah. it recoils. Yeah. So when it does that, it nowadays, I did it again in the um, in the League Cup final for Manchester United. I just scored, equalised against Aston Villa and then I did my left one, had it surgically reattached and I was fine again. But when it recoiled and when it snapped and it recoiled when I was 19 away at Leeds, it then, we didn't do surgery back then. You don't do surgery on a muscle back then. So then I've basically had a hamstring, one of my hamstrings that's reattached behind my knee mm -hmm. somewhere, reattached in, the, in my backside somewhere. And what, you're doing ultrasound and stuff like that. Yeah, you can see yeah. it's just totally yeah. torn yeah. And, and gone like that. And then it just reattaches wherever it is. So I, I've basically been have been running on from 19 onwards, running on two hamstrings on my right leg and three, the normal three on my left. Right. And of course, that then keeps me out five, six months, whatever it does. But now I'm totally imbalanced and producing so much more power, a third extra in my left. Every time I sprint, every time I do anything. And you can imagine over time, over years and years and years, that then has a real imbalance. I'm pushing mm. I'm, and I'm shearing and I'm doing... So then your groin start and then your quads, then you're this and everything, everything is just play. totally out of kilter. So basically, yes, when something goes wrong, when you're young, you can bounce back, your muscles are still elasticated and strong and this and that. But, but it's eventually catch up with you it's catching time, yeah. up. And now I'm, you know, even soon after that, I was getting imbalances. I was getting tiny tears in either of them, et cetera. So I see it as if I had had surgical, you know, intervention straight after that game, God knows where we would be. Yet you're still operating at a very high level. You're still performing um, with Liverpool. Is there any truth in the situation surrounding you when you're coming to the last year in your contract, because it's been mooted that you didn't get on or you didn't want Julier and this, a contract extension with Liverpool 
would have resulted in you wanting Julio out the door. Anything in that? Oh, no, I love Jared Julio. No, that's totally... Well, where's that crap come from then? Well, what happened is that obviously my contract was running out and yeah. I had a year left. Yeah. So so people eventually would put uh, two and two together and, um, and it was actually Rafa Benitez that came in to he the did, club yeah. and I spent two, three weeks under his passing guidance. Ship, passing ships, weren't you? Exactly, as yeah. I... As I then left, <clears throat> no, Gerard Houllier was 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 amazing. I loved. Where did that Where did that come from then? Why do people make that link? That ultimately, in your... well, it's the first time I've heard of that Julio one. You've never heard it no, before. I've never I've heard just of dropped that. that on you. No yeah, you have. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but what Rafa Benitez did say, actually, to the press and everything, was that he thought that this deal, for me to go to Real Madrid, was in the pipeline and it had been going on for ages right. and. And it simply hadn't. I remember being, and Jamie Carragher is probably my best ally when it comes to this because me and him are lying on separate beds in uh, in America in the same room. We used to room together and um, and we were on pre-season tour and Rafa Benitez has just taken over. I think we had just played Celtic in a pre-season tour game. We are just lying there talking away and, um, and my phone went and I answered it. It was my agent and bump. How do you fancy Real Madrid? They've just called me. As you know, David Beckham, we had the same agent. Yep. Um, so anyway, so I'm on the phone for, to him for five minutes, put the phone down, and Kara says, to, well, I mean, as it goes, Kara says, don't do it. And I'm like, why not? He says, you've got Raul there, Ronaldo, Morientes. You know, you're going to get into the team, all those great players. And anyway, that's another story. Would have been, but that yes. was the phone call there and then. Yeah. Yet Rafa Benitez was convinced that yeah. this had been going on for years and years right. and uh, and said so much. So... What was um, your initial reaction? I mean, you, you've obviously got off the phone. I've got, I've got a phone call from Tony Stevens about an opportunity to go to Real Madrid. I'm talking to Liverpool about a contract extension. Liverpool's a huge football club. Um, was it 2004? Yeah. Um, yeah. What's going through your mind? Well, I changed my mind about 10 times. I mean, I always envisaged myself as playing for Liverpool forever. Right. You, you know, why wouldn't you? You come through the ranks. You just don't, yeah. you don't know any different. I think once you start moving once, you become a little bit of a... You know, you're not at the next team because you support. It's just, it's then your career and you're just wanting what's best for your career. Whereas at the outset, you're at a club, you know, and you really yeah. have you're feelings. A bit, you're probably a little bit more idealistic as well because yeah. the reality of professional football is at some point you're going to move along, aren't you? Yeah, but 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 for those at a top club, it's not necessarily the case because you get all you want anyway if you're good enough True. to be at that club. And so everybody that says to me, oh, like... Ryan Giggs and Gary Neville and Paul Scholes and, and, and Jamie Carragher, are oh, they more loyal than you know anyone else? Well, no. They're just normal people and so are everybody else. And Jack Grealish supported Aston. Do you think, you know, do you think he wanted to get go to Aston, uh, go to Manchester City for any other reason? So what are you but, saying then? Because you didn't have to go to Real Madrid. No, what I'm saying is that, no, no, you're right. You're right. And that's why it was a little bit of a, 50-50 decision yeah. for me because Liverpool at the time weren't winning the league. We, it's not like we. I was getting absolutely everything. No. Um, and Real Madrid, I mean, geez, it's the, it's, the, it's the pinnacle. Is it? I think so. I think if you say to any footballer in the world, one club, everyone generally regards Real Madrid as the best, as the biggest club in the world. Do I, you? I Do think, you think it's the biggest yeah, club? Yeah, I think so. You don't think Man United is? Well, you might hit me with a stat on that they earn, you know. No, half no, a I'm not going to. I'm asking you. I don't, I'm not influencing no, think... your opinion. But from your point of view, given the fact you played for Liverpool, given the fact you played for Real Madrid and you played for Man United, the treachery of that. Um, <laughs> when you step up to, to in, the, in your mind's eye, as a professional footballer, you think Real Madrid is the pinnacle. I think so. Yeah. I thought so at the right. time. I probably think so now. I mean, if, if you go on European Cups, then. They are by miles, aren't they? Yeah. Um, and I just thought the time, it was a great time as well, you know, the Galacticos. I was going to say, what do you think? I mean, that feels like the Harlem, I always felt like, felt like the Harlem Globetrotters. Yeah. Which I don't think was a great thing. Well, in hindsight, no, but at the time, you know, you see them signing every single superstar in the world. Yeah. You think, oh, get me over there. That'd be, yeah. a, you know, I, I can't say no to that. New country, new language, weather, new experience, that white kit, that, stadium yeah. just everything I just oh and I thought to myself as well I can always come back you know Ian Rush came but loads of people go did you feel like back. a Galactico did you feel that personally when you list these names off whether it's Zidane Figo Beckham Roberto Carlos whoever else is um, did you feel that you were a Galactico 
Well, not really. No, I don't really. <laughs> it's the last thing. That's no, best mind. place in the world, isn't it? Yeah. And you think you're one of the best players in the world, so well, no, I've, obviously I felt yeah. yeah, but I wouldn't say that myself. I wouldn't say oh, no. and that, that word, but no, I felt part. Of, of course, I felt right. one of the group of star players. Yeah. Was it? Was it? Was it a massive step up? Did you? Was there a noticeable step change when you walk out of this iconic environment? And you walk into Real Madrid and you walk into all the passion, all the expectation, all the attention, all of the noise that goes with Madrid. Did you sense it? Did you feel it when you're walking into this club and you're going, hang on a second, this is a bit different. I've been at a big football club, but this is something a bit different. I wouldn't say I felt like, oh, I've jumped up at all. I would feel like it felt magical. It felt like you do a tour of the trophy room, you do a... A, a tour of the place. It it was a step up. It's you know another thirty thousand people that that are in the in the stadium. You go to the training ground. There's you know two hundred bloody press yeah. and cameramen and whatever just just waiting around. Sure, to train. Yeah. It's like just yeah filming us. It the intensity was greater. There's two newspapers over there dedicated to football, basically yep. dedicated to Real Madrid and Barcelona, as you know. I mean it. Yeah, it was a step up in intensity. Yep. I would I would say. Um, and going there was, as I say, I, I always thought I can go back. And my part in shot too, Rick Parry, who was the chief executive, who, yep. who will uh, who will uh, hear me out, would, would was that can we put something in the contract? That, or that Liverpool can buy you back. Abs I was yeah. just adamant that I had to. I'm going to go for a year, maybe two years, and then I want to come back. Do you think your time in Spain was a success for you? Yes. You do? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we didn't win what? the league. What? But Barcelona what? were Being on the bench a significant portion of the time. Well, I wasn't really. I think, what, you had 26 starts. So 39 games, 40% of the games you were on the bench. That's a lot of activity, though. That's that's not that's not being on the bench, is it? I don't know, I'm asking you. Well, if I don't know what the numbers are. But if you're yeah. saying 26 starts... Yeah, that's what that, that's the figures I've been given. That's a lot. Is it? And coming on and all the other 38 games. game season. I'd say so. Flipping For you, it is because you never finish a season. You've never had a full season, have you? <laughs> I did when I was young. Um, no, I think that's a lot. Do you? Absolutely. Well, the reason why I How ask that is because I was going to ask you a particularly pointed four. question. Because you then, you're leaving Madrid. You're going to a football club. This is by my understanding of your admission that you didn't particularly want to go to. You're now moving from Liverpool to this ridiculous Yeah, but regardless heights. of what happens after, what's the point? The point is, was your time at Real Madrid yeah. successful? What happens after isn't whether that was well, successful. Well, it kind of is, though, isn't it? Because if you're a raging success in Madrid, you ain't leaving Madrid to go to Newcastle, are you? Well, no, but but I spoke to Sir Alex Ferguson at the you know at, at a similar time. I spoke to Liverpool at a certain time, and et cetera, et cetera. And Liverpool had. An had they just bet. yeah, but had they just signed was it Torres or Suarez or anyway they had some right, but I was going to go back to Liverpool after they couldn't Liverpool bid ten million for me yeah. so I could have gone back to Liverpool but Madrid if wouldn't I had, have accepted that money it, well Newcastle came in at sixteen at the yeah. same time you but you're a player if you if you don't want to go to Newcastle you're not going are you well and that was the that was the 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 big decision at the time. And my decision was, do I sit around in Madrid, With might not other play, factors. World Cup at the end of the year, yeah. or shall I at least go home and play, but then guarantee it and get it in my contract that I can go to Liverpool after a season, which right. Liverpool said, right, do that. Okay, we're not going to be able to bid any, we haven't got the money to, right. to bid 16 to match it. Madrid was saying to me, it's Newcastle or nowhere, yeah. we're happy to keep you. But So Madrid didn't kick me out, they wanted me to stay, right. but I just felt that, with all, With all those different things. factors, yeah. Yeah. So you go to Newcastle and you're signed by Graham. He actually attributes the fact that he holds you responsible for losing his job because you get injured against Tottenham. Um, and he's looking at the fact that, you, that you're injured and he's watching you. He's walking down the tunnel. You're not getting up and you're not getting up and you're not getting up. And he's thinking, I've got no goals in this team now. I've got no, I've got no chance of, of, of doing what I want to do. I'm, I'm not saying that he he means yeah. that in a nasty fashion, but I'm saying that his perception of you is that I got a top pro and a top player um, and a top performer. When you look at your time at Newcastle and you come into this huge fanfare, this absolute 
adoration, this St. James's Park, you I mean you stand on top of the stairs, don't you? And you've got thousands, hundreds of thousands of people there. Was that uncomfortable for you? Uh, not, not uncomfortable. I mean, I enjoy, like, there's, there is a misconception that I, and obviously in my book, I, I you know, you wrote some it. things that I, yeah, I probably fuel <laughs> yeah. it. But of course, people will take lines out yeah, and, and take not it out listen context. to the yeah, rest yeah, of Yeah, yeah, no, it. I understand. I love Newcastle. I love the people. Yeah. I lived there for four years. Um, we had some unbelievable times up there. Really unbelievable. Playing alongside Alan Shearer was a big draw. Playing for Graham Soonis was a big draw. Looked yep. up to him. What a man, you know, when I was coming through at Liverpool, he was the manager. Um, and the fan base, the passion, I thought, getting back into the Premier League, that's where I belong. And I but was a fan really base you describe as being deluded. And I was really excited about going there. I started great. First half of the season, we were banging goals in me and Al, and we yep. were scoring, and we were doing great. My problem is I played against Tottenham New Year's Eve, I think it was, and trying to score a goal, stretched for the ball. And you met a tussle. And right? did my meta tussle. Mm -hmm. Paul Robinson in goal, yeah. landed on his knee, onto my foot, crushed my foot, broke a bone in my foot. It wasn't, you know, it was me putting my foot where it hurts to try mm -hmm. to score another goal for Newcastle United. But then I'm obviously out. I can't do anything. I've broken my foot. In action for Newcastle, yeah. trying to score a goal. Yeah. I then come back, try to come back. The operation wasn't that successful, and I re sort of have to have it re re operated on. And then I go to the World Cup, and I've because I've been out for so long, my whole right leg is pretty. You know, um, what's the word when you? It's not strong enough, muscular. It's de debilitated. Yeah. yeah. And it's weak, and I go to the World Cup and I do my knee. It was just simply I wasn't strong enough to support my right. body. And I'm now out for a year. So I've been out for you know four or mm. five months with a broken foot. And then I came back, and I remember, and this was the hardest bit, because I can take a few people sort of saying, oh, when is he going to be back? Is he interested in coming back? It's like, you want to see the blood, blood sweat, and tears? I'm trying mm. to get fit again. I come back, and I remember, and I'm away at Watford, and I play the ball to someone and I turn to make a run and I bang into one of our own players and his shoulder co connects with my jaw and I'm, yeah, I'm, and I'm concussion, yeah. I'm concussed. So I'm in the dressing room and, uh, and I start coming around apparently and anyway we go home and I'm watching match of the day on that night and I start hearing like something like we want our money back yeah, or what a waste of money waste or money, something yeah. like that. And to me, that's like just not on. You know, it was just like, you what? I, I just couldn't. I, that, that's me. Like, I'm pretty principled as a guy. I'm friendly with every. But if you piss me or if you do something that absolutely is not. You don't think that's and, fair. So and if it's not injustice, fair, yeah. and okay, it might have only been 100 out of, you know, 5,000. I don't know. Mm. And and that's relationship gone in Broke, my yeah. eyes. I just at that moment thought, do you know what? I worked so hard to get back, and they've started singing that, and I, I, I it just killed it mm. and break me because something like that went. But it just it, it hurt you. me. It yeah, hurt me. But do you badly. think? Do you think things Michael like? Because I don't know how I'd feel about it. I know this is an incidental, but flying to training in a helicopter and stuff like that yeah. is bloody nonsense, mate. Isn't it? It's if I it, it was an own goal in a way, but again, something like this is is taken so out of context. I lived up there. I am a massive family man. Yeah. My by that time now we had two kids, and my eldest was starting school. With all due respect, I thought that I might be going to Liverpool after the, you know, after yeah. the year, maybe the next summer because in my contract uh, each summer I could go to Liverpool. Now. So I always so thought... your heart's not really there, though, is it, mate? If you're, no, well, if, no, if, no if, my if heart's in Liverpool. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're, Newcastle are like a gatekeeper for you. They're just there because they're the club that will sign you. Because if you all you're like doing that, is, is treading time, waiting for the opportunity to get back to Liverpool. To go back to Liverpool, yeah. yeah. Is that bad? Well, I, I don't know if it's good. 
I don't, I don't know if it's good. I mean, it doesn't mean you're, you, you're it doesn't mean you that, try less. But let's not let's not sort of confuse this with with oh I I'm here and I'll just pick up money and I and I won't try and whatever. I mean, Kevin Keegan then came and I scoring goal after goal after yeah. goal. I mean. I was club captain. I was. I love no, my I'm time. Not, I'm not the helicopter your nonsense. I'm not questioning the your helicopter integrity. nonsense. Is you know, I'm a family man. When I got a day off and my kids are starting school, I knew that I wasn't going to be a, a, live in Newcastle when I retired. My home, my friends, my family, mm. I've gonna, always in been in Chester. Yeah. So when I'm playing on a Saturday and my mum and dad want to come up and, and watch to fl be able to fly them up was a lovely mm. thing to, to do. My family used to come and watch me all the time. I never used to see my wife all week. You know, for her to fly up with the with the two kids, then and my dad lived with me and whatever up in Newcastle, but for my family to be able to fly up, all this nonsense that I was flying into training every day is is, is what it is. It's a, it's a total nonsense. Right. I lived up there. Okay. Um, it culminates at Newcastle in this, I suppose... Um, ultimate deterioration which plays out later on between you and, and Alan Shearer. There's this rather unsightly situation that develops between you and him, isn't there? Where I think he's pretty much accusing you of not wanting to put yourself out to play at the back end of the season. Some have alleged that you know there's a move to Man United in the offing, so you're not putting yourself at risk. <laughs> what do you make to that? And obviously you, you too in fairness to you, you've got into a little bit of a shitty Twitter spat where you've had a go at him about where he was going to go and how long he was going to stay at Liverpool, mm. at, at Newcastle, sorry, and where he might have gone to. Um, and him coming back to you and saying, well, that was good of you to pay for 120 grand, 120 grand a week and you didn't like it up here. Tell me about that. I mean, clear it up. Well, are you mates now? No. No. So what happened there? I only found out about this months months after I had left Newcastle from a mutual friend who who uh, was at Umbro and we obviously me and Alan both wore Umbro boots and I did ha I had no clue so he never asked me never mentioned anything to me or said any or accused anything never spoken to him about it so I was as upset and as you know bewildered as anyone I about I don't know how long it was a week, two weeks before the last game of the season. So there was still a couple of games to go. I've pulled my groin. We've had a scan and you can see a big tear in my groin. It's a, at least a three-week injury. Now, bear in mind, Simon, I've had lots and lots and mm. lots of muscle injuries. I could write a book on muscle yeah. injuries. Yeah. I can certainly t teach Alan Shearer what it is to have a muscle injury. He never really suffered muscle injuries. had a couple of bad knee injuries. But... Until you've had a muscle in, you will know. It's not something that you can, oh, like put on a brave face and go, you, it debilitates. You cannot play if you've torn a muscle. It just You just can't do it. I've got an injury. I need to be out three weeks at least. We're about a week into the rehab. I'm never going to be fit to play last game. It's just, it can't happen. I'm never going to be fit. But it's the last game of the season. And I've torn muscles before. And I didn't have any idea about any other club. I mean, that's been proven. I mean, literally Alex Ferguson phoned me about a day before I signed. And he can tell you that. So all that is just nonsense to make the the, the story like, have yeah. a bit more yeah. credibility. I had no idea where I was going to go. Newcastle, in fact, in fact, played silly buggers with me at, at the stage because about a year before they put into the paper that they had offered me a new contract. And I think it was about 20% of what my current contract was. And as soon as they offered it me, it went into the local paper that night. Michael Owen signed it. And all of a sudden, I'm like, they've offered me a what? And when I didn't agree to this like 80% pay cut, mm. it was Michael Owens decided or, or rebuffed. The, it's like, mm. it was total mind games, total games up there. But um, what about, I mean, it's, so, a, it's a bit nasty what's going on here though, isn't it? I mean, you've played together, you've come there because yeah, you wanted to play with But them. let's get the story out of yeah. the way. So I'm three week injury at least, and I'm a yeah. week into it. Two days before the game, Al pulls me into the into his room and said, "How is it?" I'm like, "It's getting better. Like it's obviously getting better. I'm feeling better, but I'm like screwed if you think I can, you know, sprint around and whatever." And he's and he said something like, "Well, should we go? Should we 
give it a go. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Let's, yeah, let's give it a go. You know, nothing to lose. If it tears further or, you know, if it's then. So I go out day before now. So I said, well, there's no point in me trying to train. Let's give it another day. It'll be, and I'll try to train the day before. Day before Aston Villa comes, I go out. Physio says, right, come on, we're going to go and do it. You know, I get in before everyone else. I go out. I start running. We're building and building and building. It's fine at about 50, 60, 70. As soon as I start sprinting, it's like, oh, mm. it's like, I can feel it tugging. If I push a little bit further, it's just going to go even more. So he's like, well, should we push it further and see? I was like, Phys I know his name, but physio, I've done this, you know, 25, 30 times. It's just going to make it worse. Why don't, you know, why don't we just quit while we're ahead? We got myself up to 80%. You know, I can't train as soon as I kick the ball or sprint. So I go back into the into the after training to Alan's thing, and he goes, "How was it?" And I said, "If I had pushed any further, it would have gone." And he said something to me at the time, saying something like, "Well, are you not going to give it a go or whatever?" I said, "Well, do what you want, but I would suggest stick me on the bench yeah. if we need a goal with 10, 15, 20 minutes in the game I'll, I'll goal it. hang a bit. I'll stay around the and I'll try to get a chance and I'll knock it in." That would if you if you start me, I'm going to be going like that. You know, 15, 20 minutes in, I'm going to be coming off. And so, but do what you want, and that's the absolute God's honest truth. Mm. That is exactly how it went, and it's exactly how it played out. Mm. Alan put me on the bench, brought me on with ten minutes to go to try to score a goal, and and that's exactly how it played out. To say I refused, to say I didn't want to, you know, to say I whatever you want to say bottled it or this or that and the, i've played in a million games you know i've never bottled a game hey, of football so in my life you love liverpool and you wanted to end up back at liverpool how do you square the circle of going to or committing the cardinal sin in some people's minds by joining manchester united well because when i finished when i ran out of contract at newcastle and i was on a bosman i phoned cara and i said speak to to brendan see if yeah. he see if fancies, you know, me. fancies yeah. me and he said no we've just signed or we're just about to sign robert and gog right so so okay. so we uh, yeah so basically didn't need me and time moves on you know yeah. there's, there's suarez and torres and blah blah blah. There's, you know and i'm liverpool ain't gonna wait for me i've got no resentment whatsoever but I don't respect resentment the other way because my first port of call was to go back to the club I well, But by the way, because you said to me, Liverpool, go to Newcastle for a year. Did they not come back in for you again? No, because you I did injured. my knee. You were yeah. injured, yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah. you were injured, yeah. yeah. So at every opportunity then, it just there was just never the opportunity. Right. Um, so my first port of call, my first call was to go back to Liverpool. Yeah. Now, after that, when Liverpool say no, what do Where you, you want me to yeah. do? What yeah. You know, what... Like, what are your options? Yeah. And I'll tell you what my options were. They were Hull City, Everton, yeah, and Manchester United. Right, okay. Yeah. And they were the three teams that came in in the Premier League. I'd had my stint away, didn't yeah. want to go anywhere else. And so Premier League, they were the three teams. Mm -hmm. With all due respect, Hull were yeah. you know, in the relegation scrap yeah. and all the rest of it. Didn't really want to live away again playing in a relegation yeah. scrap. I was still, you know, decent mm. player. Um, and now I'm thinking, Everton, yeah. I'm going to get absolutely. Yeah, no, I get it. And I had spoke, so I and I was prepared to no, sign I get it. I'm for just hoisting you by your own batard because you told me how much you love Liverpool. But I'm but prepared to go to everyone Everton. Would gone, everyone would have gone to Man United, wouldn't they? In well, I spoke to David. I flew to America. David Moyes is on holiday. Mm. I flew to America, played golf with David Moyes, spent a full day with him. I was like, I was a boyhood Everton fan, but I'm going to be hated now. But I've got no option. Like, and I was just sort of, I've just got to, I've, I can't do anything. And then I landed home literally within a day. Nicky Butt phoned me and said, uh, just so you know, the gaffer's going to call you. Right. I'm like, who's the gaffer? Because obviously I was with Nicky mm -hmm. Butt at Newcastle. I was thinking, does he mean Sooners? Does yeah. he mean, you know, any one of them? He goes, Sir Alex. I'm like, about what? He goes, he wants to sign you. I'm like, you are joking. Blah, blah, blah. Put the phone down. 
Sir Alex phones me, you know, the, you know, that day or the day later or whatever. And that was that. And then, but I'm thinking, of course I'm thinking, Liverpool fans, they're going to heck, but what can I do? I phone Brendan Rod. I phone like, I can't, you know. Does it rankle with you, Michael, that maybe you don't have quite, given the fact that you were such a star for Liverpool for seven years, that there seems to be that maybe I'm being unfair, and you can correct me if I am, we'll and I'm not like trying them. to be that this. I'm not, I'm not trying to be unfair, mate. Honestly, um, that there doesn't seem to be this mutual appreciation society that that other players have had at Liverpool that perhaps you should have got. Robbie Fowler seems yeah. to have more recognition and more of a relationship with Liverpool yeah. than you seem to have. Yet you were a product of their youth development. Yeah. You were a, a phenomenal player for them. They got decent value out of selling you. You wanted to go back there. Does that, in any shape or form, we're all big boys and life moves yeah, on. Yeah, exactly. It? But we does are it, big does boys. it disappoint yeah. you then? Not well, ah, got got over that. No, I was. Uh, yeah, I mean, but it's always been like that. And and if I said it any different, I'd be lying. When I was twenty and nineteen and whatever, and banging in goals left, right, and centre for Liverpool, of course there was. You know, I was a hero and adulation and whatever. But it was nothing like Robbie Fowler, mm. and. Me, as I said to you earlier, me and Jamie Carragher used to room, and he would he would always be saying the same thing to me. He says, "Do you know what? I know why." He says, "You may they feel Liverpool fans in general, Liverpool sort of Liverpool people, Liverpool fans in general think that you made your name for England. It's like you're England's, right? And you're not Liverpool's. Liverpool's yeah. And let's get me let's get it right. Without generalising, Liverpool's not the most patriotic place no, in the world, not at all." But I said to Kevin, I won the golden boot in my first frigging year here. Like, wow. He said, I know, I know, I know. But that's just how the people is, feel. Yeah. And at 18, you went to the World Cup and you became a global super in a white shirt, not in a red one. Plus the fact that Robbie's obviously a scouser. Yep. I live in Chester, which is half an hour away. Um, so there was that affection for Robbie, and don't get me wrong, there was a big affection for me, but mm. not to the same, the level. same level. You've recently um, been doing what I think is um, a very challenging situation because it's a very focused, focused scenario now around refereeing and VAR. Tell me about that because this, you're coming to some criticism for it about the mic'd up show that you're <laughs> doing. But there seems to be this propensity in this show for you to ask a question, the answer comes back, and then there's no interrogation of the answer. Now that feels to me like that's the direction you've been told to go in. But given that I think you're quite forthright, and I, and I think you've probably got quite an inquisitive mind, why is that manifesting itself in the structure of this show? You ask Howard a question, he gives you an answer, and that answer is accepted. So, so this show is brand new. It's a 30 minute show match officials mic'd up once every four weeks we've got a four and a half minute ad break and we've got to get in however many clips in 20 you know five minutes mm -hmm. the whole usp of this show is to for you as the viewer to hear behind the scenes what is going on in the var hub yeah. So let's say the big, lo the, the latest big one was the Arsenal goal against, or the Newcastle goal against, against Arsenal. Arsenal yeah. But the whole chat around the back of that, which is what the show is about, it's not about my opinion or anything else. Like, I wish it was. I wish we had an hour. I wish we did half an hour every week or whatever it is. Right. But this is a new show that we're just trying. Hopefully everyone likes it. Hopefully we can commission it more. Hopefully we can do it longer, etc. But I've got 25 minutes about 20 of those minutes is to give the viewer the inside scoop is to listen to what's going on in the background. And then the other five minutes is to say to Howard, are you happy with this? Is this right? Is this wrong? And for him to almost be the, you know, the overriding, you know, come to the conclusion in this situation, in the future, we would expect the decision to be different. Yeah. Or yes, we like the processes or not. If I had more time, I would love to ask my own questions and yeah. all the rest of it. You might like that. That's not what the show is about. The show is about letting Arsenal fans, letting Liverpool, letting whatever fans, Liverpool fans when Diaz's goal was, 
what was the process why did it what are they saying behind this that's the usb of the show not michael owen saying hey howard you know this is rubbish this let's scrap this and let's no, do no, it's no, a no, load no, of that, rubbish that, that's not no no i understand it and i understand the challenges that you've got the only observation i make is i get tired of pundits not having a strong view and people sitting on the fence and not having the courage to say anything but you, i'm not you, a pundit in this situation well no you're a presenter i understand that but but i sit on shows and and in some perverse categorization i'm perceived to be a presenter but it doesn't mean i always think it's never the question and i understand that you've shown me the framework of this show so it makes it slightly more difficult and maybe they've got to change the framework of the show because quite frankly everybody has seen the decision they haven't heard the audio it's not the first question that you ask that i think is intriguing it's the interrogation of the answer because when you're yeah. when you're asking howard webb for his explanation of this i don't think that I, personally yeah that a tacit acceptance of what he said at face value no, I know, is a value to anybody. Simply, but so the dilemma for us, we can only do. We did. We decided to do four. We could do three clips, and actually, in that in that short period of the week time, we could do three clips, and actually, I could then have a few questions yeah. and interrogate yeah. him more. Yeah. For, for because the question friends. would abound, wasn't it? When someone tells you we haven't got the camera angles to see the ball, the next question is. Why not? When Why are not? they coming in? Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. So we can do that. But what we do is we end up doing two clips and really doing them well yeah. and interrogating how and all the rest of it. Or, but then we get sort of, hang on a minute, you know, what about this goal or that goal or this red card or that? I mean, we had a situation the other day doing the Arsenal game where we had no time. We'd gone through it with a producer, with everyone, with the people at the Premier League. And we went through the show. And we hadn't got in Kai Havertz, potential red card, yeah, yeah. Bruno Gimares, yeah. potential red card. Well, you can't please all the people all the time. And I didn't have a is, question. Yeah. And, I, and, and eventually, we were saying, we, we haven't got time for it. And I'm like, guys, we're missing we this. simply have to, mm. even if it's like two seconds, we have to do mm. this. Southgate. <laughs> Southgate. I'm going to finish with him. You played with him. You know him. What's your assessment on Southgate? And do you think that we're going to win the Euros next summer. Um, I like Gareth Southgate. I think he could certainly have done, you know, being a bit more aggressive in certain situations. Um, but I do think he's built a, a good culture. That team spirit that we've got will take us far. I think we're, you know, people enjoy being an England player, enjoy going away. Um, so, you know, be careful what you wish for is what I would say to to a lot of people. If he wasn't, and I guess he, it might be his last sort of tournament, yeah. um, where the hell do we go from there? Who's capable? I mean, Eddie Howe's probably the one. He's not going to leave new. No, he's no, young. And, soon, yeah. and so where do we go? I think, you know, we've got a manager that I think could, you know, that that, that could do, taken us to a final at the end of the day already, and he's only going to exp improve for experience. So, yeah, I'm, I'm in the Southgate camp personally. Yeah. Do you I mean obviously we, we always seem to find no not always but there's always this case often this case not always that like France when they built up they built up and they built up they got to semi-finals they got to finals and then they won tournaments mm. we must be at this stage now mustn't we do you think that we'll win the Euros this is your last question so you have to answer it forthrightly as you have all the way through do you think that you, yeah. we'll win the Euros yeah I think I think it's us or France. Yeah, they're the best two teams. But I've like I've been to tournaments when I thought, well, do you know what, we're the best team or the second best team in this, and it's so bloody hard. But there's no standout. I mean, it isn't like it was before. That I mean, the, no, we're, we're, we're average, a better side. Italy, are, this is my point. You know, this, this, this is the time, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Belgium yeah. have gone now. Yeah. Their golden yeah. generation gone. You know who is the who is that? It's it's as I say, France and England. Yeah. But it's it's it is hard. I mean, but well, we got the players, haven't we? It is. We have got, we the, got players. the players. Yeah, we, got the players. we definitely got the players. No, I, 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 you'd be disappointed if this group of players didn't win something. Yeah, Michael Owen, thank you very much for being so upfront with me. Thank you so much. Upfront with me, son Jordan, is brought to you by William Hill. Future episodes can be found on YouTube, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. 18 plus. Please gamble responsibly.